Can I share my screen? Okay. Hi, hi, Rebecca. Hello. Uh, have you tried to share a screen? So, uh, last yeah, I'm not allowed to share my screen. I oh, think you're making a co-host or something. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Let me do that. Uh, maybe. Barbara, are you there? Somehow it's not showing up. Um, no. Should be straightforward. So I go to participants, right? Yeah, if you right click on me, that is usually what's allowed. I don't know if you can do, can't do it because you're a co-host or, but. Yeah, I'm not sure I can do it, so. Jimia, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to make um, Rebecca a co-host, but as a co-host, it's not obvious that I can do that. Jimia? Yeah, I, there, Barbara? I got a uh, email from Andre saying that he, I mean, I put everybody as a co-host, but he said he couldn't join. And I had a little bit of a, a problem also, mm -hmm. but I, I see, um, so some people may, may have problems connecting. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But, uh, Barbara, can you first make uh, Rebecca the co-host? I made everybody a co-host, but I'll I'll do that. But and I see, you know, we're getting people. Ming just joined. Doug's there. Bin Gao. There were two other people there. I don't know where. I I assume they're still there. It I looks like seen a, people are there, but it looks like uh, not everybody is a co-host. Um. So Barbara, can you make a speaker, Rebecca, uh, to be the co-host? I'll I'll give it a try. I don't think I have the the ability to do that. Okay. I agree. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it either. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I did turn on screen sharing, by the way. So, so Rebecca should at least be able to share her screen. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
that, no, well, that's all I really yeah. need. I couldn't do it before, so uh, that looks more promising. Well, uh, Rebecca, this is our first of uh, Kanes Manor seminars. This it is. is. <laughs> so, we were running something over the summer. <coughs> we we were we were doing that, but this is a more formalized version. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, have a, a bear with us, please. Sure. But your yeah, the screen looks great. We see your slide. Let me make sure I can do a pen. So, um, but I mean, I once was uh, hosting uh, an event and turned out that the, the hosts were at a different room <laughs> from the participants. <laughs> so, I think everybody, people are trickling. So, the sharing is on, right? Yes. I can see yeah. it. Yeah, no, I, it wasn't to begin with, but I think Doug enabled it. Okay. Um, okay. Let's give it one more minute. So it should meow for later meetings with the speaker. We just use the same Zoom link. Is that the idea? No, I, think I, I, I did yeah. set Doug. I did set it up that way as a recurring meeting. But I'll I'll go back and I'll make sure again. I I put all the P and A condensed matter faculty as co-hosts. But again, I'll figure out why. I know I put Andre in there, so I'll figure out why Andre can't. Uh, There's Andre two seems to be here now. Uh, in the email that you sent me, there was one for me to meet with people. Yes. Uh, but so what I used to meet with Chimiao earlier, and then right. this one, and it's a separate. Right. I, I set up two. Mm -hmm. um, is Andre that, that's what I wanted to know. So so if there's a if the answer is I should use the the other link for meeting with you. That's for fine. your individual okay. meeting. Use the other link. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So 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 the point is that with uh, Rebecca's permission. This seminar is being recorded, and you probably don't want your individual meeting to be recorded. That was Ming's sharp I observation. I did automatically record the seminar me, uh, presentation. I did not uh, record individual meetings. Thank mm -hmm. goodness. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, um, Barbara, for the individual meetings with Rebecca, um, I don't know if whoever signs up first to the meeting, could they be made a co-host or host? Because otherwise we are not able to share the screens. At least last time I tried, I could not. No, there was no problem. Yeah, okay. we, were, we were sharing screens. So okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay. I think it's all good. Um, all right, so uh, with all these organizational things getting underway, mm -hmm. uh, I think we'll get started. Um, so it's a, uh, a uh, pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Professor Rebecca Flint as uh, uh, our seminar, uh, uh, the speaker of our first of the Kindness Matter seminars uh, this semester. Uh, Rebecca got uh, her PhD from Rutgers uh, with uh, Pierce Coleman uh, in, I believe, 2010, and uh, she was subsequently uh, Simon's uh, postdoc uh, fellow uh, at MIT. And uh, she's been on the faculty at uh, Iowa State University uh, since 2013. And uh, there she currently is uh, uh, an associate professor of physics. Uh, Rebecca's interest has been uh, uh, on strongly correlated systems, uh, including uh, condo systems uh, and plus trade uh, magnets uh, and uh, other uh, settings for exotic uh, physics and uh, so without further ado uh, uh, Rebecca uh, t please take it away I think I'll let everybody read the, the title okay well thank you um, it's a pleasure to be uh, here today uh, giving you this talk um, and what I want to talk about is some of the work that uh, was originally started 
uh, with Piers uh, Coleman and Premi Chandra back in 2013, where we proposed uh, the idea that the hidden order in uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2 could be described by a kind of spinorial hybridization, uh, which meant that your heavy Fermi liquid uh, ended up breaking symmetries and occurring via a phase transition. Uh, and uh, I sort of continued to explore this idea and learned a lot about uh, what's possible and how you really can describe the order. And uh, we were motivated in part by the question, well, if it's a, really a spinorial order, this is something that uh, has been looked at in Bose-Einstein condensation systems, uh, but not really in materials at all. So we wanted to know if there are any signatures of the fact that your order parameter was really a spinner, uh, given that you can't measure the spinner itself directly. Uh, and I believe that there are, I don't know that they've been seen, but I will uh, argue that there are definitely signatures that come from the spinorial nature. Um, and then I will also mention briefly, there's another set of materials uh, based on presidimium uh, that exhibits sort of similar spinorial order, uh, spinorial hybridization, uh, or at least has the possibility for that. And so I'll discuss uh, sort of all of these possibilities in the context of these systems. Uh, so I can't see uh, any of you. Uh, so if you have questions, I don't know how you usually do it, uh, but feel free to just interrupt me. Uh, I would love to answer questions. Yeah. Okay. And also maybe put in the chat if that, if you don't want to shout and, uh, uh, and I'll make sure that Rebecca gets the chat. Yeah. Okay, so first I wanna uh, acknowledge all the people who've been involved in this work. So as I said, it started uh, with Piers Coleman and Premi Chandra. Uh, and I'll show some nonlinear susceptibility data from uh, Art Ramirez's group at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, and then I've had two graduate students working on this, Milan Kornyaka uh, and Guanghua Zhang, uh, and then uh, two postdocs, uh, John Van Dyke, who's now at Virginia Tech, and uh, Victor Quito. Uh, so we sort of started off looking at uranium ruthenium 2 silica 2, took a detour to really understand uh, the more general problem and have come back uh, now to try to do a better job on uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2. Uh, so here is sort of the fundamental question that underlies hidden order and why people have cared about this for so long. So this uh, material uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2 was discovered uh, back in the 1980s and they measured this uh, specific heat curve uh, and you see two clear mean field phase transitions. And uh, if you're familiar with sort of heavy Fermion density wave systems, you think, oh, this is probably just gonna be an antiquire magnet with a superconductor at low temperatures. And if it's not that, maybe it's something else, but we can, uh, should be able to straightforwardly identify the broken symmetry and the order parameter and publish a couple papers and then put the problem away. Uh, and that turned out to really not be the case. Uh, it's now been more than 30 years and we still don't have, know what the order is. And it's extra surprising because if you look at this specific heat curve, you can integrate up the entropy to uh, the hidden order transition and find the entropy of condensation. And you find that it's one third R log two. So the, this is a uranium system, your uranium moments you expect to have at least R log two entropy. So here you expect a large order parameter. Uh, and so you should expect that it should be easy to see any moments associated with that order parameter. Uh, but uh, there's still been no moments, there's still no obvious order parameter. There's a uh, nearly uncountable number of papers that have been published uh, on this material since then with uh, hundreds of experimental papers and over 30 different uh, theories which have brought up all kinds of really interesting ideas. Uh, and we're still interested in this because if it looks so straightforward and uh, after all of this effort, we still haven't been able to understand it, maybe it means that we're missing something pretty fundamental. Uh, and so uh, in order to sort of talk about our proposal, I wanna talk about the basic ingredients and where that sort of fundamental uh, novel idea can come from. So this is the magnetic susceptibility of uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2. Uh, so you see at high temperatures that you have Ising-like uh, local moments, which are sitting on your uranium sites. Uh, this is a metallic system. 
uh, where conduction electrons are coming from the ruthenians and uh, other atoms. Um, and then you see that uh, around somewhere below 100 Kelvin, the susceptibility turns over and it looks like it's turning into a heavy fermion metal where you're going to get a heavy poly susceptibility. Um, and okay, so this sort of justifies this initial idea of treating this as a heavy fermion metal. Uh, but what's interesting is that it's an Ising heavy fermion metal. And in fact, the Ising local moments quench to form an Ising heavy Fermi liquid. Uh, so if you look at the uh, G factor of your Fermi surface and you look at normal conduction electrons, you expect an isotropic G factor that looks like this red line uh, and doesn't depend on the angle of the field at all. Uh, however, if you measure the Fermi surface magnetization with de Haas van Alphen, you can pull out the G factor and you find that it has this cosine theta dependence uh, on the angle from the uh, C axis which suggests that the heavy electrons now uh, are Ising-like. Uh, and moreover, you can look at the nonlinear susceptibility, so chi-3, uh, and you see that uh, below 100 Kelvin, where you start to develop this heavy Fermi liquid behavior, your nonlinear susceptibility follows this cosine to the fourth uh, theta dependence, which is also exactly what you expect from an Ising susceptibility. So you see this in the nonlinear chi above the hidden order transition, at the hidden order transition where there's a jump, um, and then below the hidden order transition in this uh, G factor. So this is, uh, okay. So in order to find uh, an Ising heavy Fermi liquid, the sort of most straightforward picture is that your Ising local moments are actually coming from a non primers doublet. Uh, which is always in tetragonal symmetry, which is what uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2 has, it's always uh, has a not, it can have, sorry, there is a non primers doublet in tetragonal symmetry that is always Ising like. Uh, if you're, and that's sitting with an even number of F electrons, if you have an odd number of F electrons, you have to be very fine tuned to get an Ising uh, local moment behavior. Um, so this sort of motivates the idea that we want to look at what's happening when we have a non uh doublet ground state. Uh, and there is another set of systems uh, that also sort of exhibit what I'm going to call weird condo physics, meaning not the conventional picture. Uh, and so these are uh, in cubic materials. You can also get a ground state 4F2 doublet that actually has no magnetic moments at all doesn't have any uh, dipolar moments. Instead, the shape of the electrons in the ground state doublet has uh, these two different shapes. So one is sort of squashed and one is elongated. And these are degenerate due to the very high symmetry of the cubic crystal field. Uh, and so this uh, quadrupolar doublet uh, can then similarly undergo the condo effect. Uh, so Dan Cox did a lot of work on this. Uh, and there's a set of um, 1, 2, 20 materials. Here's some of them uh, that Sotoro Nakatsuji and others in Japan have been working on, which show indications that not only do they have this ground state doublet, but you, this doublet has some signatures of condo effect. Uh, and the materials uh, do seem to order uh, at ambient conditions, but under uh, pressure, or in field, these, this quadrupolar order can be suppressed. And then you have the question of what's going to happen uh, on the other side once you've suppressed it. Um, and in, when you suppress it in field, you end up with this small region of heavy Fermi liquid. So that was in sort of the secondary motivation for what we are looking at. So uh, probably many of you are familiar with this, as Chi Miao and Andre have uh, both worked heavily on what the sort of global Doniac uh, phase diagram looks like for condo materials. Uh, so the fundamental uh, picture is that uh, when we have these kind of heavy fermion materials, uh, the conventional picture is you can form a heavy Fermi liquid where your local moments are quenched uh, to become part of the conduction C, or your local moments can uh, order uh, independently of the conduction electrons. Uh, and form an antiferromagnetic phase. And you have a quantum critical point between them that's sometimes screened by superconductivity. Uh, and it leads to a rich phase diagram that has many open questions about quantum criticality uh, and superconductivity. And you can further enrich this with frustration. Uh, and there's really a lot of interesting questions here. Uh, 
but actually this material, this phase diagram is really only dealing with Cromer's doublet materials. Uh, so these are materials with an odd number of F electrons, so based on cerium or terbium. Uh, and what I'm interested in is materials with non Cromer's doublets uh, that uh, require actually a different phase diagram entirely uh, and have a whole set of new rich physics. So just to explain uh, what I mean by Cromer's and non-Cromer's doublets, when we have F electron materials, the spin orbit coupling is very strong. And so J is the correct quantum number. Uh, and these uh, two J plus one levels are split by crystal and electric fields. Uh, and then J itself can be either half integer if you have an odd number of F electrons or integer if you have an even number of F electrons. And we know that uh, half integer and integer spins have very different behavior under time reversal. So integer spins behave sort of like what we naively expect. They behave like a vector and you apply time reversal once and your spin uh, basically points in the opposite direction and you apply time reversal a second time and you get back to your initial state. Uh, whereas uh, half integer spins are actually described by spinners. Uh, and so you have to look at your spinner wave function and when you apply uh, time reversal once, it takes you to an orthogonal state. And then time reversal twice takes you back to your original state, but with a minus sign. So I like to picture this as uh, traveling around the surface of a Mobius strip. So you're, you're back sort of where you started, but you're on the other side of the piece of paper. Uh, and it's only once you go around four times uh, that you come back to your initial state. Uh, and so we say that fermions or half integer spins and bosons or integer spins have distinct behavior under double time reversal symmetry, uh, where half integer spins pick up a minus sign and integer spins don't. And this leads to the fundamental idea of Cromer's theorem, which is that when I have half integer J multiplets, they have to be at least doubly degenerate. Uh, and so my uh, I end up with Cromer's doublets that are protected by time reversal symmetry. But when I'm looking at integer J ions, these may have non Cromer's doublets uh, that are not protected by time reversal, but instead by crystal symmetry. Um, however, generically, your non Cromer's uh, integer J ions are going to have singlet uh, states. So, right, so here is sort of a picture where you can get odd J only doublets, uh, even J you can get doublets. This is the case for. Uh, cubic symmetry for j equals four. Uh, and these non Cromer's doublets can be either magnetic or non-magnetic. Uh, so the one in cubic symmetry that I mentioned before is a purely quadrupolar doublet uh, that doesn't have any expectation of j anywhere. Uh, and if you look in tetragonal symmetry, you have uh, a Ising magnetic doublet that has a non-zero expectation of jz, but uh, Jx and Jy are zero, and instead you actually have quadrupole. The in-plane components of this doublet are actually corresponding to quadrupolar moments. Uh, you can also get uh, non karmas doublets in trigonal and hexagonal symmetries, and they behave uh, somewhat similarly to those in tetragonal symmetry. So then we all know what effect does this have on the condo physics? So here is the conventional. Uh, picture of where you get a condo coupling. Uh, and this is, I start off with a F electron. So here I'm imagining a cerium, uh, which has a ground state that's 4F1. And then I have virtual valence fluctuations to the 4F0 state, uh, which here is guaranteed to be a singlet. And this is a generic picture uh, for Cromer's doublets because the generic excited state is a singlet. And so these, uh, virtual valence fluctuations to a singlet generically give me an antiferromagnetic uh, interaction between the local moment and the conduction electrons that are mediating this, these valence fluctuations. Uh, and so this is a conventional single channel condo effect, which looks very simple, but of course has a lot of really rich physics in it. Um, and now we can go to the non Cromer's picture. So here I'm going to put one of my uh, Kramer, non Cromer's doublets as my ground state. And my virtual valence fluctuations are then going to be to some state with an odd number of F electrons. Uh, and so this ex generically has an excited state that is a doublet, not a singlet. Uh, and so this is sort of easiest to think about 
when you think about the quadrupolar doublet, uh, because you're going to again get a antiferromagnetic interaction that's screening the ground state doublet. Uh, but here, it's actually going to have two different uh, channels or symmetries of conduction electrons. So this is easy to see in the quadrupolar case, because here the moment of my F electrons is quadrupolar. And the conduction electrons can come and screen that with a quadrupolar moment of their own. But conduction electrons are, are spin one halves, for example. And they have, in addition to that quadrupolar moment, a spin moment. Uh, and so, so here tau is representing the quadrupolar moment. And I have conduction electrons that are both spin up and spin down screening that moment. And they're perfectly degenerate at this case. Um, and this picture goes through for the Ising, uh, the Ising cases as well. It's just a little harder to see. Um, and so you get the two-channel condo effect, which has very different physics. So if we look at the impurity of this, we can understand really well. Uh, if you take the condo coupling in your two different channels, uh, you can then find that you have a quantum critical point uh, when your two channels are degenerate. Uh, when one channel is stronger than the other, you get a heavy Fermi liquid with that particular symmetry. But non karmers doublets are always tuned to be exactly in this point. So they're always critical. Uh, and this quantum critical point, we can understand, it has a zero point entropy of 1 half r log 2, which corresponds to 1 Meyer on a fermion. Uh, and it has lots of different singular fluctuations in charge, magnetic, and superconducting channels. Uh, and so, what I'm interested in is what happens when we go to the lattice. So when you go to the lattice, this one half R log two entropy has to be quenched. So you can't have the exact same critical state. Um, however, you can do a lot of different things. So you can just form magnetic or quadrupolar order uh, analogous to the uh, Cromer's Doniac phase diagram. Uh, and, uh, or you can form a non-Fermi liquid. So this is a lot of what, uh, Cox and Jarrow we're looking at. Uh, you can form a composite pair superconductivity, superconductor, which uh, Coleman, Andre Selick, and Key, and then myself, uh, Maxine Zero, and Piers Coleman have looked at. Uh, or you can form something that we call has static order, uh, which is the analog of a heavy Fermi liquid. And so it's a spinorial hybridization that breaks time reversal symmetry. Um, and this in uh, other work that people have done has been, you can call it either a channel symmetry breaking heavy Fermi liquid or a diagonal composite order. Uh, so we call it hastatic order, mostly because it's uh, catchier. Hasta is a Latin word for sphere, uh, and it has the same abbreviation as hidden order. Uh, but the main point here is that the state cannot form a normal heavy Fermi liquid uh, because that would mean breaking the channel symmetry. So uh, and then that would take you to this hastatic order state. Rebecca, can I interrupt you for? Yeah. Yeah, just an elementary question. So in the cubic case, uh, you have uh, uh, all the degrees freedom which are uh, non-magnetic. Mm -hmm. uh, so spin serves as, uh, uh, spin provides the two channels. Yeah. Uh, microscopically, so in this tetragonal case, you have one component which is actually magnetic, right? Among the three. Yes. components. And, and how does a channel index work for, for that component? So probably the easiest way to answer this is to tell you to wait a little bit further into, oh, okay, the, sure. chat, uh, or into the talk, and I will show you the microscopic Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. um, but the quick answer is I can see, so I have a doublet ground state, and one channel has a singlet excited state. Two mm -hmm. channels has, has a doublet excited state. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you were to add more excited states, that would give you more channels. But there's still, so in other words, in the cubic case, because the spin degeneracy is robust and uh, so I have a robust channel degeneracy in the mm -hmm. two channel kind of way of representing it. So maybe you'll come back to it, but in this tetragonal case, is the channel degeneracy uh, protected by symmetry? Yes, it's still protected by time reversal symmetry because the okay. excited Cromer's doublet is protected by time reversal symmetry. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, thanks. Okay. So what we're going to focus on is looking at the analog of the heavy Fermi liquid. 
Uh, so we're going to assume that it's going to go want to go into some kind of heavy Fermi liquid and not into some more exotic state, um, like a composite, like a superconductor or a less exotic state like a magnet. Um, and so in this case, we are looking at the hybridization of essentially our non cromers moments uh, with conduction electrons. So our uh, to so we can sort of very quickly see the consequences of this as a spinorial hybridization. So here, uh, here is my local moment uh, ground state. And uh, for convenience, I'm going to represent double time reversal as that two pi rotation around my Mobius strip. Um, and so I know that my uh, integer spin goes back to itself under double time reversal. Whereas my conduction electrons are spin one half or some other Cromer's uh, degenerate states. And so these uh, pick up a minus sign when you do double time reversal. And so when I write down my generic hybridization term, this involves a mixing between my local moments and my conduction electrons. And I know how these two states behave under double time reversal. And I know my Hamiltonian has to be invariant under double time reversal. Uh, and so this tells me that my hybridization, the mixing term between these two, actually has to break time reversal symmetry uh, and break it like a Cromer's or spinner system. So the hybridization V is actually going to uh, behave like a spinner. So it breaks both uh, single and double time reversal. Uh, and essentially, this is sort of fairly naive, right? You're mixing spin one half with a spin one. So of course, your hybridization has to carry spin one half to, in order for uh, spin to be conserved. OK. So right. So to sort of get the basic uh, picture of hybridization, I want to go back again to the Cromer's picture and give the very cartoon version of how you develop heavy Fermi liquid behavior. So here we have our local moments, which are our F electrons, and we have our conduction electrons. Uh, and as I lower the temperature, these start to hybridize via this V that we were talking about. And we form uh, heavy electrons, which are a mixture of my conduction and F electrons. Uh, and you can naturally see that they have a much flatter band, which means that they're heavier. And you develop a hybridization gap uh, that's essentially this mixing between your two types of electrons. Um, so we treat this, uh, so here again, I'm just sticking with the Cromer's picture, which some of you are familiar with. Uh, so we treat this uh, using this kind of valence fluctuation picture. And my Cromer's doublet is using this uh, excited singlet state. And so I'm going to represent this with an auxiliary boson B. Uh, but in this one channel condo effect, uh, because this excited singlet carries no quantum numbers, my hybridization doesn't break any symmetry. So this is going to actually develop as a crossover. Theoretically, we describe this uh, single channel condo effect as the condensation of this auxiliary boson, which ends up reducing the valence from uh, one to having some occupation of this excited state. Uh, and uh, this is sort of within a large N theory where in the large N theory, this would turn on a phase, phase, as a phase transition. But once you include fluctuations, it smooths that out and you get this kind of crossover behavior where your hybridization turns on below some T star. So now we go to our two channel case where our excited state is a Cromer's doublet. And I, instead of using a single auxiliary boson, I'm going to use two, one for each of the two excited states. And I'm going to label them up and down. Uh, and then I package this together in a spinner and it transforms like a spinner because this is a pseudo spin one half. Uh, and so my excited Cromer's doublet is always carrying a magnetic quantum number uh, because it break, it's protected by time reversal symmetry. Uh, and that means that my hybridization, as I showed you, is breaking time reversal symmetry as well. Uh, and the hybridization is going to develop as a phase transition. And so again, this is described by the condensation of this uh, auxiliary boson, which is now a spinner, and I get some occupation of this excited state. And so a lot uh, of the way we can think about this is has having a tiny moment in this excited state that can then order in some fashion. That's not the entire story. All right. Uh, so let's see what we know about this, right? So the hybridization means that the excited state has to be partially occupied. And this uh, excited moment then has to pick a direction in which to quench its entropy. 
So generically, any of this uh, spinorial hybridization uh, states are going to break time reversal in some form. Uh, and exactly how will depend on how the spinner is ordering. But we can uh, sort of pull out some generic statements about these states. Uh, so, as I said, details will depend on the symmetry that you're starting with and how your spinner is ordering. But it should look like a heavy Fermi liquid. So it should have screened moments, heavy masses, etc. cetera. Uh, and you should have a hybridization gap that can only develop at a phase transition. And this hybridization gap is, is large. Uh, so it's on the order of the square root of the Condor temperature, which is now your phase transition temperature times the bandwidth. Um, and this state will generically break time reversal. It may be staggered like an antiferon magnet. And this gives us moments. And these are generically small. Uh, so these are of order TK over D. So you can get a large gap, but very small moments. Uh, and this is sort of the uh, features that would, were motivating to us about uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2 because you can have a large order parameter uh, that's opening up a gap at your Fermi surface and very small moments that are hard to measure because the primary order parameter is harder to measure directly. Uh, and the conduction electron G factor should follow your F electron magnetic response. So you expect to get an Ising G factor if you have Ising doublets. If you have non-magnetic uh, doublets, you would expect actually a non to have non-magnetic uh, conduction electrons at low energies. OK, uh, and then finally, the heavy electrons are going to have a complex uh, spin structure in momentum space, especially because we have this very strong spin orbit coupling. So in our one channel picture, uh, we have uh, a scalar hybridization that's just mixing these two. And so we get a heavy electron that's a fairly straightforward combination of conduction and F electrons. In our two-channel case, our hybridization uh, is sort of generically a matrix. Uh, I mean, it's really a spinner, but uh, it has more indices, and so you can get much more complicated behavior. And this is somewhat reminiscent of topological insulators. So what I want to talk about now is what's possible with these spinner orders. So first, we talked about this excited state, which has this tiny magnetic moment. Uh, which is essentially, if B is representing my excited state, apparently I changed notation, so I'm sorry for that. Um, so B is a two-component spinner representing my excited state. And I can write down this order parameter, uh, B dagger sigma B. And so this is uh, actually a, the composite order parameter that has been talked about extensively for uh, these systems. Um, and uh, so this is how you write it in the sort of condo picture, where tau is our channel. Uh, and sigma is our spin in this case. So this then can essentially depend on the site, and I can order it in different ways. So the most straightforward thing I can do is either make it uniform everywhere. Uh, and so in this cartoon of this sort of ferrohostatic uh, state, I'm only hybridizing F with my up electrons. Um, and so I get a heavy up band and then a light uh, down band. Alternately, I can alternate my hybridization between up and down as I go from site to site uh, and get something that is like an anti ferrohostatic state. And this is a little bit more complicated than the naive picture, so we'll come back to this in a minute. Um, but this uh, excited magnetic moment has the symmetries of a magnetic moment. So it actually has all the symmetries of magnetic order at this point. Uh, which is a vectorial order and doesn't have any signatures of the spinorial nature of the hybridization that uh, I put in the title of the slide and the talk. So I obviously believe is quite important. So that leads to this question of, is this the only order parameter that we can construct uh, that is going to be gauge invariant? Uh, and so uh, before I answer that question, I just want to tell you a little bit about this ferrohostatic order. So you get a spin polarized heavy Fermi liquid where oh, let's shift it. your down bands is this middle band that doesn't hybridize at all. And your up bands uh, are these two bands that are heavy and have opened up a gap. Uh, and so naively, you get a half of a hybridization gap where half of your electrons are heavy and have a gap and half of them are light. Uh, and because this has tiny magnetic moments, this is actually favored in field. So we did an analysis where we looked at a competing antiferroquadrupolar order in the cubic case, and you could find a dome of 
this uh, ferrohestatic heavy Fermi liquid um, in magnetic field, which is uh, identical to what they've seen essentially uh, in the presidium irid iridium 2 zinc 20 material. And so to sort of summarize the features of this, uh, your spin up and spin down bands have substantially different effective masses. The symmetry is equivalent to a ferromagnet. Uh, and in fact, here there are no uh, extra order parameters. Uh, and we have tiny moments. Uh, they can, okay, they can't break addition, they can break additional lattice symmetries. It's, sorry. Um, because it's hybridizing with the, right, it's possible to have some broken tetragonal symmetries as well, um, or broken cubic symmetries. Uh, right, sorry. So you can have some additional broken symmetries, but they're associated with the order of the moments, uh, and they're not any different than symmetries that you would break in a ferromagnet. Um, that's not a sort of straightforward Ising ferromagnet. But fundamentally, there's no signatures of spinorial uh, origin of the order parameter here. You can really just treat it as uh, a ferromagnetic system if you're looking at a Landau picture. Okay, so now let's go and look at the antiferro hastatic order, which is much more interesting. Because remember, time reversal acts very differently on spins and spinners, and all of our intuition for building magnets is based on spins. So if I want to construct uh, an antiferro magnet, I just put together I pick two sublattices, uh, and I expect that this is a, going to obey a time reversal like symmetry, where if I apply time reversal and then say translate everybody by a lattice site, I get back to my original state. But because if I take uh, my hybridization on sublattice B to be the time reversal of hybridization on sublattice A, and then I apply a time reversal to the whole thing, uh, my sublattice B is actually going to go to minus the sublattice A. So it's picking up this extra sign uh, that's really doesn't affect the moment uh, at all, but is a real sign that's there uh, because it is a spinner hybridization. So if I don't have any hopping between my F sites directly, uh, this set can be gauged away. And if I'm in a ferrohestatic state, it can also always be gauged. Any signs that I put on can be gauged away. Uh, however, if I have this F electron hopping uh, and I have this two sublattice order, uh, this is going to generically break time reversal. Because if I have hopping uh, of these F electrons between sublattices, I can have a conduction electron come in as a spin up, hop as an F electron, and then leave as a spin down. Uh, and so this uh, hopping flips spins and breaks time reversal symmetry. Uh, so I can get around this, though, if I, instead of two sublattices, introduce four sublattices. So I put uh, the time reversal of A, the time reversal squared of A, time reversal cubed of A, uh, and arrange these uh, here in this 1D case as A, B, C, D. So the hybridization pattern looks the same, but here these have a positive sign and these have a negative sign. Uh, and so this the moments look the same, but the symmetries that are broken are different. This does not uh, break any time reversal-like symmetry, or, or not break a time reversal-like symmetry, whereas the two sublattice case does. Uh, however, in this four sublattice case, uh, I no longer have a center of inversion. So this uh, order has broken the inversion symmetry. And you can get more complicated patterns in higher dimensions that break different symmetries. But so these are the two fundamental concepts. So this may seem very abstract, but we looked at the uh, cubic phase diagram for, uh, the, this is a, the simple phase diagram. Uh, and we also put on, in addition to the condo coupling, the Heisenberg coupling that allows us to treat uh, the F electron hopping as a, essentially a spin liquid of our F electrons, which are here quadrupolar moments. Uh, and we find that we get both ferrohastatic and both kinds of antiferrohastatic uh, phases uh, in our cubic system. Um, so these are really there in the mean field phase diagram. And I should just a caveat about this: we didn't look for we find you find what you look for. So we only looked for these sort of uh, uniform and staggered moment type phases. Tetragonal symmetry is actually much richer uh, 
and much more complicated. So the phase diagram for tetragonal symmetry is much uglier. Um, but we have, uh, again, more interesting possibilities. OK, so let's uh, go and look at these order parameters, right? So I told you the different broken symmetries. So now I want to ask the question um, of what is possible uh, when I am ordering this spinner, right? So, uh, so I'll discuss the gauge symmetry of the spinner a little bit later. Uh, but what I'm doing is constructing all possible bilinears of the spinner that are invariant under gauge fluctuations. Uh, and in the mean field picture that I showed you before, everybody happens. Uh, I have a single phase that breaks all of the possible symmetries. But we know that the mean field picture is only uh, valid if I'm looking at, say, SUN spins and not for the SU2 spins that we're actually looking at. So beyond mean field theory, these guys can develop at different temperatures. Uh, so this is a, a sort of schematic phase diagram. So what we can first develop is the amplitude of the excited state uh, spinner. And because this amplitude itself doesn't break any symmetries, it can develop as a crossover uh, above the symmetry breaking transitions. And you can get hybridization gaps from these. Uh, then I can talk, look at the direction of the spinner on the site. This is the composite order parameter that I talked about that behaves exactly like some kind of magnetic order. But what I get, uh, I get now an additional order parameter that comes from intersite interference terms. So it involves this kind of hopping from two different sublattices through the F electrons. Uh, and this breaks additional symmetry. So this captures the broken time reversal, um, the broken uniform time reversal in a staggered uh, state, or the broken inversion symmetries. And this is generically complex. So we get this uh, sort of rich possible phase diagram. All right, so now I want to turn uh, to uranium, ruthenium, to silicon two, uh, and talk about how some of this manifests there. So this is, uh, a tetragonal system, and we're basing our theory on the uh, non commerce doublet, which is Ising like uh, and protected by a tetragonal symmetry. And the form of this doublet very strongly uh, affects the form of the valence fluctuations. And I'm sorry, I'm missing a little figure here. So there should be a, a figure for the gamma six conduction electrons, which are elongated along the C axis. Um, so there's two different shapes of conduction electrons that can screen. Uh, the gamma five ground state moment. And I can write down the valence fluctuation term um, by looking at what, it, what kind of conduction electron is produced when I annihilate gamma five and create this excited state. So I can do this and create a gamma six electron, which has this elongated structure, or I can create a gamma seven uh, conduction electron, which has a squash structure. Um, and this is the exact form of my valence fluctuation Hamiltonian. Uh, and so you see uh, the two channels are really represented by these um, two terms. OK. So now we have this picture. And I'm going to go through what we've done to solve this uh, very quickly. Uh, we introduce auxiliary bosons to represent the excited states and auxiliary fermions to represent my uh, gamma 5 ground state. Uh, and so I can replace these Hubbard operators with uh, combination bilinears of bosons and fermions. And so I get a Hamiltonian that schematically looks like this, where I have conduction electrons hopping. Uh, I have an energy of my excited state, which is occupied by my Bs. I have uh, an emergent F electron hopping, which I put in there uh, by hand, although you can also get it if you have a magnetic interaction between your F electrons and decouple that. Uh, and then I have hybridization of my F electrons via these two different channels. OK, so, and, uh, so here we can see this emergent gauge symmetry that I talked about. Because B and F are auxiliary bosons, I can always uh, rotate B by this e to the i theta. And as long as I simultaneously rotate F by e to the negative i theta, my hybridization term is invariant. Uh, and at the same time, I have to rotate this emergent F electron hopping uh, as well in order to keep the gauge invariant Hamiltonian. 
And so this tells me that the gauge invariant bilinears of the spinners that I can conduct can construct are the amplitude on site, the moment direction on site, and then this combination of this F electron hopping uh, and an intersite moment essentially. So this is this intersite interference term uh, where the spinner can essentially flip uh, as it goes between different sites. Okay, so uh, in order to actually see all of this rich physics, uh, we had to expand upon the theory that I originally developed with uh, Piers and Premi, where we looked at conduction electrons that were just uh, S electrons sitting on the uranium sites. In order to actually describe both uh, the case where your excited spinner is pointing in the plane, which turns out to be a pretty good descriptor of static, the hidden order, uh, and the antiferromagnetic case, where here we're putting the spinner pointing along the c-axis. And so uh, both of these states are magnetic uh, in this excited Cromer's doublet, but they're not equivalent. Um, so this state we could not capture in our original picture. In order to do so, we had to introduce two conduction electron bands, and so we chose uh, to take the two ruthenium sites per unit cell and put a dz squared orbital on there. Uh, we believe that our, the physics we're getting from this is going to be generic, uh, whereas sort of the one, uh, the s electron band actually was a fairly special case um, and could not treat this antiferromagnetic state. Okay, so with this model, we could look at the microscopic theory. Um, and here is a sort of one example picture uh, that my student Milan Karniaka produced uh, where you're tuning uh, the effective hybridization strength, the ratio of the two channels, uh, which you would naively expect to be tuned by pressure uh, or iron doping in uranium uh, on the ruthenium side. Uh, and you can get a first order phase transition between the spinner pointing in the plane and the spinner pointing out of the plane. Uh, and here, this is this two sublattice case, but we can also get four sublattice cases as well, both both occur sort of in different places in the phase diagram. Um, so we can reproduce the sort of rough uh, phase diagram of uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2 under pressure, where there is a uh, first order phase transition between the hidden order and the antiferromagnet with large F electron moments. Um, and yeah, OK. So, and then the other point I want to mention is that the spinner, we can see that the spinner is very weakly pinned in the plane. So here we fixed it to some particular phi angle, uh, but that's a very weak uh, pinning. So I've identified these two phases as saying this looks like this phase diagram, but there's really no reason you should believe me at this point, uh, because uh, right now, the two orders that we have, if we look at these uh, excited moments, these size, I can either have the moments along the c-axis or in the plane. These are moments of my excited moment and they're quite small. But if we look at the microscopics uh, and I look at this uh, picture where I have the hybridization uh, spinner is pointing along the c-axis, I actually get large F electron moments in this state. So I get large, uh, antiferromagnetic moments that are around a half a Bohr magneton, which is what they see uh, in neutron scattering under pressure in uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2. Whereas if instead I look at the uh, hastatic spinner pointing in the plane, I get really tiny moments that are on the order of 0.01 or smaller, depending on what valence I'm using. So that's why I identify this phase as the hidden order where we get tiny moments or no moments, uh, and the other phase as the antiferromagnet. So then there's the question of what about the spinorial order? So uh, this is sort of an additional broken symmetry. And we picked, uh, so in uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2, we know the antiferrum magnet is staggered uh, along the c axis the, with staggered planes uh, that are shown by what these spins are doing here. Uh, and then we can pick either the two sublattice order that breaks time reversal or the force of lattice order that breaks inversion symmetry. And so we can capture all of the order parameters if we sort of look at these two possibilities separately, right? The, uh, the excited state moment, either being along the c-axis or in the plane, and the arrangement of the spinners uh, being either two sublattice or four sublattice. And 
These two things are somewhat independent. Uh, so if we look at the two sublattice order, any two sublattice order uh, is going to uh, produce uh, this phi order parameter I talked about, and this gives you a staggered uh, quadrupolar shear type moment. Um, and then if it's coexisting with these guys, you also see that you have the broken time reversal. And so you get a uniform moment in the plane. Uh, and that if you have your, sorry, you get a uniform moment that is perpendicular to the staggered moments here uh, for both cases. And then if I look at the four sublattice order, this generically breaks inversion symmetry and all four sublattice orders will actually have a uniform dipole moment that's in the plane. Now, of course, these are metallic systems for arbitrary filling, so you won't be able to see the dipole moment directly, but you'll see that these are no longer centrally symmetric. And then if I look uh, in the case where I have four sublattice order of these two particular uh, spinner directions, uh, I get toroidal dipole moments that are perpen perpendicular to the excited state moments. Uh, so these break both time reversal and inversion symmetries, and they're also staggered. So, okay. So these are all that's possible. Uh, now, these additional moments are expected to be actually even smaller than uh, these moments, than these moments here, these staggered moments I said were already really small uh, because they're suppressed by this order of the F electron hopping over the bandwidth. And we expect the F electron hopping to be on the same order as the condo temperature. Uh, and so, uh, sort of at best, and so you're expecting these to be very small. But there are some really sensitive experimental techniques out there like nonlinear car effects or second harmonic generation uh, experiments that could in principle detect really, really tiny moments. Uh, and so we propose looking for this. Uh, and in fact, car effect measurements have already been done on uranium ruthenium to silicon two, and they're suggestive uh, in that you see above the hidden order temperature, which is here at 17 and a half Kelvin, you see a tiny uh, uniform magnetic moment essentially uh, turning up in your care measurement uh, and is trainable in field. So this could be analogous to uh, this uniform moment turning on if you had to choose a lattice order. Now in our microscopics, the energy between these two particular orders is fairly small. Uh, and so it may well be that different samples have different, uh, uh, different spinner orders. Uh, and it may well be that in field you can go from one to the other. That's still a question that we're investigating. But it's possible that you could see these additional orders. Okay. Uh, so I want to sort of summarize uh, our picture. So we have experimental signatures. And because the uh, second order parameter phi is suppressed by TF over D, we expect the experimental signatures will be dominated by psi, except for these really small moments. So we can roughly reproduce the phase diagrams of uranium ruthenium to silicon two under pressure uh, and in magnetic field. Um, I think this guy is, should be rotated. Uh, so this is the iron doped sample where you start in the antiferromagnetic phase and then uh, favor the development of the uh, hidden order, which we also see generically. Uh, and then you'll see that your Ising hybridization uh, is reproduced. Uh, that's sort of, we put that in by hand by saying we're hybridizing with our heavy, uh, with our Ising non-Kramers doublet. But actually, you have to be really careful uh, because if you have this immersion F electron hopping, uh, you're going to not necessarily have all Cromer's degenerate bands uh, in the end, but you should still expect to see uh, the, I, what looks like these anisotropic G factors, even with not all your bands being perfectly degenerate. You expect a hybridization gap to open a T hidden order, which has been seen uh, in uh, ARPES and STM measurements on uranium ruthenium G silicon 2 as well as optical conductivity. Uh, and so there's been a lot of other measurements and one of the most controversial sets has been the question of tetragonal symmetry breaking. Uh, and then there's the other question of what about uh, the in-plane moments associated with this XY uh, order. So first I want to just 
briefly uh, in one slide review the tetragonal symmetry breaking picture in uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2. Uh, so there's a lot of different measurements uh, and you can sort of classify them into three groups. So one is looking at the lattice. If you're breaking tetragonal symmetry, which you do whenever you order uh, an antiferromagnet uh, in the plane, uh, you expect that you're going to develop an orthorhombic distortion. This was found in one experiment by Yuji Matsuda's group, uh, and several other groups have looked for this and not found it. Uh, you can then look at the magnetic response, where you, they, via torque magnetometry experiments, uh, also done by Yuji Matsuda's group, they found a chi xy that turned on at the hidden order. This is the amplitude of this chi xy. Uh, and this uh, suggests, again, that you have broken time reversal symmetry now in your magnetic response, but it was only found in small crystals. Uh, so as you go to larger crystals, it was suppressed. Um, and then finally, you have this uh, response, essentially, of the Fermi surface, the electronic response. Uh, and so this is uh, Ian Fisher's group did this elastic resistivity measurements uh, and found that you get essentially a, a response that behaves like a two component order parameter that's breaking your tetragonal symmetry and coupling to a pneumatic order parameter. Uh, so this would be compatible with our uh, perpendicular uh, psi in the plane pointing along the 110 direction, which is also consistent with these other two uh, moments. But why is it so hard to sort of pin down the uh, tetragonal symmetry breaking? And there's actually, I have two different answers, um, which I think are both happening. Uh, so the first is if we look at our, our uh, microscopic picture, uh, we see that we have large Fermi surface distortions that are breaking tetragonal symmetry. And these are essentially of order one because they're of the order of the hybridization gap. Whereas the moments and the uh, in-plane susceptibility are all suppressed by a factor of TK over D, which is around 1 over 30 for uranium ruthenium to silicon 2. So this is, should be much smaller. Uh, and then the lattice terms uh, are also similarly suppressed by TK over D. And in the microscopics, they actually a, tend to be generically a factor of 10 smaller than these magnetic responses. So we do find you know, tiny quadrupolar moments uh, and small jumps in the elastic coefficients, which have not been seen, and a small orthorhombic distortion, which has been controversially seen. Uh, so answer number one is there's three couplings when you write down the Landau theory. One of your uh, order parameter to the lattice, one of your order parameter to the electrons, uh, and one of your order parameter to the magnetic field, which gives you this torque response. Um, and so you expect this response to be large, and these responses might be very small and hard to see. So if we estimate uh, this, we expect that you wouldn't actually see these jumps in the elastic coefficients. Uh, and then to talk about the torque magnetometry, uh, so I told you before that the hastatic moment, if we're looking in the plane, it's pinned very weakly, and we have four equivalent minima. Uh, and so if we rotate uh, the field, as you go around, you expect that uh, for small fields, your moment is sort of going to get stuck in a minima, uh, but eventually it will roll over and try to follow the field. Uh, and so you expect this to give you a twofold response. So this is the torque magnetometry data uh, that gives you the chi xy I showed on the previous slide. And you see above the hidden order, you get only a fourfold response. And then below the hidden order, you get a twofold response. This x axis, I'm sorry, is missing and should be phi, the angle in the plane. So as I said, for small fields, you expect your order parameter to just follow, uh, to get stuck in these minima. And so you actually expect not a smooth response, but first order jumps uh, in your moment direction and thus the torque uh, as you go around. So here's a calculation we did in our Landau theory, which is based on the microscopics. And this blue curve with the jumps is what you expect uh, in a small field. And uh, and if you want to actually reproduce the smooth response that they seem to see uh, in the experiments, you can apply an external uh, Z2 strain, and that thing essentially keeps you stuck in uh, one minima at a time uh, as you go around. 
Uh, and so you get this smooth response where you're not jumping between minima. Uh, and so this sort of twofold strain uh, is something that you would expect to get naturally at the surface of your samples. Uh, and so this is a natural explanation uh, that your small samples have a much larger surface area compared to their volume. And so you're going to get a signal that's dominated by your surface signal. And so you would expect to see this kind of uh, twofold behavior there. Uh, and then uh, you, so that sort of explains why you would see it in small samples. And then when you go to larger fields, you get the fourfold response because your moment and your field are just following one another. So, uh, okay. So this actually leads us to uh, an interesting prediction uh, in that if at small fields and temperatures, the moment is pinned uh, and at larger fields, the moment is following the field, we actually expect there should be a transition as a function of field in the plane where you go uh, from one of these directions to the direction uh, to, of your moment pointing along the field direction. These are all staggered moments. Um, and this uh, is something that would not have been seen before necessarily because while people have looked in transverse field, uh, your, uh, if you look at what's happening with your two different order parameters, the X and the Y components, uh, you see that the magnitude of the order parameter almost doesn't change as you go through this second order phase transition. And so any kind of scalar quantities like the specific heat should only show really tiny jumps that we estimate are going to be completely within the experimental noise. But if you measure with something that's uh, sensitive to the direction, like elasto-resistivity, uh, or we calculated the thermal expansion, uh, you should see jumps or divergences as you cross both of these transitions. Whereas a specific heat would be essentially blind to this transition. So, okay. Um, and I'm running out of time. Uh, you should tell me if you want me to stop. Um, Maybe just a couple of minutes. And okay. So I just have one more thing uh, to say before we get to the conclusions, which is this question about the XY moments. Uh, so, the picture predicts X, y, mo tiny moments in that uh, plane that are pointing in a particular direction. And you should be able to see this in neutron scattering in principle. Uh, and there were three different neutron scattering measurements that actually ruled out these uh, moments uh, to the order of 0 0.0054 magnetons. Uh, and then there's the really question of why are the tetragonal symmetry breaking signatures so confusing? Um, and the answer is that you have to think about random strain disorder. So our in-plane moments are very weakly pinned uh, in the plane. And so we can think of them as described by a 3D XY model with a very weak Z4 anisotropy. And so an infinitesimal random strain uh, is known to kill 3D XY order. This is by uh, Imri Ma back in 1975. And so what we have is not quite this. Instead, we have a weak anisotropy, which means that instead of our in-plane fluctuations being completely soft, they have a very small mass. So we have these transverse fluctuations in plane that have a small but finite mass. And that means in order to disorder the moments, you need a small but finite random strain. And this is not hard to obtain in, in uh, uranium ruthenium two silicon two crystals. We know that there's random strain already there. Uh, and so, it makes sense that you could have in your samples the tiny moments in the plane disordered. And so what's interesting here is that actually has static order is more than just in-plane order, right? It's, we're not really just describing the physics of the whole problem with the 3D XY model. Instead, we, above T hidden order, we don't have any moments, uh, or at least in the mean field picture, we don't have any moments. And at the hidden order temperature, the moments develop and are forced into the plane. And they're also forced to choose their arrangement if they're ferro-hastatic or anti-ferro-hastatic. And so all of these things uh, will survive. They essentially have large energy barriers between those different states, whereas the energy barriers of moving the moment in the plane are very weak. Uh, and so this would be consistent with uh, neutrons not finding the moments because they're not ordered in the plane but with mu SR and NMR measurements that have seen essentially what look like disordered local fields uh, on the order of 10 Gauss, which is on the order of the 0.014 magneton 
moments that you might expect. And what's additionally interesting is that this mass of the transverse fluctuations can be enhanced. So if we apply a strain or a magnetic field in the plane, we can actually enhance the barriers between the different minima. And you can then induce, if your disorder is weak enough, uh, transition into the uh, ordered phase. So this is sort of a, a generic sketch of a phase diagram where uh, over here in the ambient field conditions, the disorder is strong enough to disorder the in-plane order, but you still have the phase transition at the hidden order temperature. But as you increase your field, you start to raise up uh, some of your uh, free energies for some phi angles. Uh, and eventually, uh, these barriers grow up above your disorder strength. And so it actually picks uh, a direction in the tetragonal. You've broken the tetragonal symmetry by hand, but you're going to see that you've actually uh, developed non-zero moments at this point as well, right? So you're non-zero staggered moments at this point as well. So you're breaking additional symmetries at this transition. Do you have an estimate about the, what sort of a, a string field you would need for this to happen? So I don't know the intrinsic disorder strength. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have, a, I don't have an estimate. Uh, I just am guessing that we're over here. Uh, but I don't know how far you have to go to get to this point. And it's probably going to be highly sample dependent. Mm -hmm. how, how would you uh, compare that uh, with, uh, with hydrostat, I mean, with isotropic uh, string, uh, like you know, the, in the pressure? Um, so the pressure is going to actually drive a very strong uh, transition between the moment pointing uh, in the plane and the moment pointing out of the plane. I see. Yeah. Um, Presumably, I, this. Sorry, I should also mention that uh, as you go through this transition, uh, like the field locking transition I described on the previous slide, uh, this should not ha show up essentially in the specific heat because your magnitude of your order parameter is not changing. It's just the direction is getting fixed. Uh, and so you would expect uh, to maybe see this in elastoresistivity. You would see the fact that there is a transition. I thought people have done you know, actual pressure experiment on these things, right? Have, have people not? No. May I, I don't have know. done pressure or strain? Yeah, people have done yeah. pressure and strain. Yeah, no, yeah, you know, actual strain, in, in plane in actual strain. Have people seen this uh, induced order, magnet order? Oh. Not that I'm aware of, no. I see. I don't know that people have done elastoresistivity in applied strain. Uh, mm -hmm. At least I'm not, I'm not a, f f a well, he's not with sufficient, uh, like obviously whenever you do elastoresistivity, resistivity you apply some strain, um, but I don't think it's been done with large strain or in transverse, large transverse fields. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so that's uh, essentially the end uh, of my talk. Um, so really the main point is that non-Kramer's condo physics is very different from Kramer's physics uh, and we can get uh, Essentially, the only example that I know of a spinorial order in a material where you can actually see the signatures of the spinorial order uh, via this additional order parameter. Uh, and so I'll stop there and answer any questions that anyone has. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, for um, a nice talk. Uh, we have uh, time for some uh, short questions, comments. Uh, Andrew, you want to start off? Uh, Andrew, you're muted. Sorry. Yes, uh, one is very quick to the phase diagram that's shown right here. Um, mm -hmm. At the mean field level, so what I'm trying to figure out is the right hand side, the um, the pink. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. where phi. Okay. Uh, Which conduct. phase diagram? This one like, or this one? No. Yeah, this one. Yes, where your mouse is right now, the phase okay. number three. So at the mean field level, when your slave boson has condensed, the moment you have non zero value expectation of B, mm -hmm. The phases two and three would be indistinguishable in the sense that you always will have expectation value of bi dagger bj on different sides if you have one on bi dagger bi. Yeah. So what is the physical meaning of the phase three? Like what does this off diagonal in real space order mean? Right, so this is uh, essentially telling you, so when I have a uh, order with spinners, right? I have different signs, say, uh, between my four sublattice sites. 
Uh, and that's the only way that an inversion symmetry is broken is by having the signs of my spinners. So in order to actually see the signs of the spinners, I have to essentially hop through the F electrons. Um, and so this is this interference term uh, that essentially allows the sign of the spinners on two different sites to interfere. So the implication is that even though those spinners might be disordered, uh, meaning that they melted, they no longer have expectation value, they kind of remember the relative sign as you go yeah. along the line. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So it's like uh, it's like a vestigial order where it sort of remembers that it has this relative sign, but it doesn't remember the actual direction it's pointing. Just like a nematic order, it remembers its furrow, but mm -hmm. it doesn't remember uh, yeah. which direction. Okay. Cool. Hmm? Yeah, so, so can, I mean, can I yeah, ask go ahead. a question? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, please. so, yeah, I'm very interested in your, your, the initial pressure induced phase diagram. So, where do you expect the uh, the, 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 the anti ferment order moment to be? If you uh, it's still it, really it, small. Uh, so, I mean, what, what's the direction of it? So, the direction will be in the plane. Uh, no, we, I, know. I mean, which direction in the plane? Do you have a perpendicular or parallel with the strain direction? That, that was my question. Ah, uh, um, it should be parallel with the strain direction, yeah. So, so here we put a field, uh, but this is equivalent to putting a, um, x squared minus y squared strain on it. Uh, and you would get the x squared minus y squared order. So if you did the other way, you would get the other order. So, so I mean, so compare with the no uh, initial string, how much, uh, how much more the moment is expected to, uh, to increase? Uh, Not the, much, actually. The moment size should be almost unaffected. Uh, so it's still going to be on the order of like 0.01 Bohr magnetons or possibly smaller. Uh, so it's still, it's as hard an experiment as the uh, original one in terms of moment size, but now you also have to be in the supplied stream. And there's no real guarantee of where <laughs> where the space transition occurs in the stream. Um, okay, okay, okay. No, I'm just thinking yeah, whether one might be possible to attempt to try this. Yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah. I would, I mean, I think um, elastic resistivity would be a much easier measurement. So you might try to uh, wait and see if other people can do the elastic resistivity uh, before you would try to do the neutrons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, I have a question, Rebecca, about uh, this uh, pressure-induced anti magnetic order. Mm -hmm. So in the description you give, um, it would, uh, uh, in essence, still hybridization driven, isn't it? Yes. Um, so, but for practical purposes, is that the same anti magnet as one would normally get? Uh, or, or there's some distinction in the properties like entropy, et cetera? There's probably some, dis there's some distinctions in principle, uh, or yeah. So in the mean field picture, there's absolutely distinctions. Um, mm -hmm. In the, if it's this two sublattice order, uh, there's actually like the moment, uh, the excited moment points this way, but the other order parameter points in the plane. And mm -hmm. so breaks to diagonal symmetry. Um, so in principle, you would have broken to diagonal symmetry in your antiferromagnetic phase. Um, which has actually been seen, uh, but that's, I think, independent um, of the antiferromagnetic order. Uh, so, and it, that would be small. Uh, you would expect to see hybridization gaps still. Uh, you would expect to still see this Ising uh, G factor for your uh, conduction electrons. Uh, the main thing is that you would have a large uh, F electron moment, a large F2 moment. Um, and so, that, of course, would couple strongly to the antiferromagnetic order generated by RKKY coupling or whatnot. Uh, and so uh, probably whatever antiferromagnetic order you get would sort of have a mix of mechanisms. Um, but but, I'm, I'm just wondering, so in the, if I have, say, a vanilla uh, antiferromagnetic, say, spin density wave, mm -hmm. uh, the entropy should that's involved in the condensation should track the magnetic order, uh, the amplitude of the magnetic order. Uh, here, it seems like you have uh, this uh, R log two or half of R log two entropy that would be uh, involved in the condensation regardless of the amplitude yes. of the magnetic order, right? Yes. It seems like there's, there's some 
uh, at least quantitative, but potentially even qualitative distinctions with uh, a genetic spin density wave like antiferromagnetic disorder. Yeah, so this still has a large Fermi surface. Yeah, I can understand that. The Fermi surface yeah. hasn't changed. Yeah. But, yeah. The, but it has a large Fermi surface, but it still has uh, F2 moments, which are your mm -hmm. ground state moments. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I just also wonder whether the the spin waves are the same or not. Um, I think they will be substantially similar. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, because essentially the spin waves, um, they're going to be like spin waves of of that Ising moment. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, what are your actual collective modes that are happening here, right? It's the uh, collective modes of your excited moment, um, which has the same, uh, yeah, so I don't know. Okay, so the basic structure of them, you know, the symmetries, the Goldstone modes should behave similarly uh, to a, an antiferromagnet with that mm -hmm. pattern. Um, because it's coming from the excited moment, uh, the magnitudes of that excited moment is much smaller, um, and it has, it's anisotropic, uh, so I'm not really sure, uh, in the details if it would look similar or different. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, the broken symmetry as in a spin channel is the same, but maybe yeah. thing, things like at least the stiffness versus order parameter, it, it might be different. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? If not, let's uh, thank uh, Rebecca once more. Thanks very much for a nice talk. Thank you. I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll clap for, on behalf <laughs> of the uh, audience. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, that's a very nice talk, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I guess uh, on the schedule, you, there's a gap, uh, which uh, we thought it would be nice to give you a break. Yes, I <laughs> and, would like uh, to eat lunch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I forgot the who is next, but uh, you have the schedule. Ming Yi at two? Yeah. yeah. OK, very good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, well, great to see you. And uh, thanks very much again. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, OK, bye. OK, bye.